here <clears throat> and uh, spent off and on through the week glancing at it, but yesterday in, in tents. Nobody was home. Everybody was working. So it was just me and the cats, and so I got in the study in my chair and I didn't even watch baseball, and they won. Indians won. Anytime I take a look at it, they lose. But, <laughs> but then I, I did want to get everything out of my into my system and out of my system before the Browns preseason game came on, and uh, what a letdown that was. So, so enough of the sports, and uh, sports can be depressing just about as as much as the world events and uh, national events. So uh, here we are in uh, early chapters of Judges after we started in the middle or partway through with Gideon and it's becoming more and more interesting and uh, the patterns continue to evolve throughout this period in Israel's history when uh, they're surrounded, of course, in, in the land of Canaan, surrounded by enemies whom they were supposed to have driven out, but they didn't. So God says, okay, now that uh, you haven't driven these enemies out, I'm just going to leave them here, and uh, what's the purpose of that? Uh, let's look again in chapter 2 at uh, verse 20. Chapter 2, 20, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I have commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice. And of course, there's a clue that runs from the Garden of Eden to the last chapter of Revelation. You haven't heard my voice. You haven't obeyed me. We're not under the covenant, but we are under some beautiful promises. He's given them to us. We know what they are. We know Paul's epistles. We, we know what our future is. We know what our present is supposed to be. But uh, these people were given the covenant that he had given to their fathers, and they haven't hearkened to his voice. So guess what? I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations with which Joshua left when he died, that through them, here's the reason, I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it, or not, yeah, whether you will or you won't, <laughs> it's a, an axiom, uh, continues all the way. You can't miss it. Paul tells you the same thing. In verse 23, therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So the Lord left the nations there because of their disobedience in order not to hurt them, but to strengthen them, to prove them. Here's the test. Here's the battle. Here's the warfare. How are you going to do? Are we not in a warfare? You better bet we are in a warfare. You don't hear or see anything much about Satan at work at this point. But once he entered at the Garden of Eden in the serpent, deceived Eve, and caused Adam to disobey, since that point, he has never left. He's around. He's in the heavenlies. He's in the earthlies. He's everywhere. And always at work to get the people of God away from God. Go ahead and worship Israel your way. Go ahead and worship Baal. Worship. Be religious. Satan's way. He doesn't mind churches that are open. Matter of fact, I'm sure he's very happy with a lot of the churches that are functioning quite well as far as numbers and money and programs are concerned. Um, as long as he can keep them away from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, then he's okay with it. As long as he can keep Israel from obeying the covenants that God had given to their fathers, he's okay. Let Israel exist. They want to be a nation of uh, holy priesthood, a, a nation of priests, and, and Jehovah's, the real Jehovah's Witnesses are these Israelites here. And uh, go ahead and be, but don't forget about good old Baal over here and pick you up some uh, brides over there from 
Moab and these uh, Hittites and everybody else. So as long you got to remember Satan's at work all the way through. Whether you see his name or anybody refers to him or not, he's there. The adversary is always there. And besides that, human nature is also there. So uh, God simply says, Here, here's what I wanted you to do. Do it. Everything's okay. If not, you're going to have a problem. So I'll leave these guys here to test you, to prove you, and to teach, to teach you. Very interesting, isn't it? It's very interesting. Look at verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least to such as before knew nothing of it. So here's a, a generation of Israelites, young Israelites, who had not known war. And uh, you've got to be prepared for the battle, is what he's saying. You, you see the principles that run through. You have to be prepared for the battle. And so he left the enemies there to prove and to test and also to teach this generation how to stand up to the adversary, to the enemy, in the warfare that they are in and were always in as we are in today. Now, look at verse uh, 2 again. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least to such as before knew nothing of it, namely five lords of the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hevites, who dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon, unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So there's the capstone on it. Put them there, these five nations, kings, to prove the Israelites to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord. Now, if you go down to... Uh, I think we ended up somewhere in eight, verse 8 or 9 last week or with, with Eglon's where we ended up. But in verse 8 of chapter 3, therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Again, because up in verse 6, they took their daughters to be their wives, gave their daughters to their sons, that's the, the Gentiles, and served their gods. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So he's, his anger is hot again, and he sold them into the hand of Cushnam Rishthayim, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Cushan Rishthayim eight years. And I pointed out last week that his name means double darkness. What a name. And with the children, verse 9, of the Lord uh, cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel, went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishthayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishthayim, and the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. Now, there, and it doesn't, there are no details as to how uh, Othniel carried out the battle. As it was with Gideon, we had detail after detail of the battle. Uh, and how they won, and, and how he uh, got the troops inspired, and how they took over, and getting uh, the whole story in great detail. But here, there's not much said about how he did it, but the thing is, he did it because he was doing it out of obedience, and another reason he, he did it is in verse 10, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel, went out to war, and the Lord delivered. Othniel knew this. He knew it was because the Spirit of God had come upon him, as the Holy Spirit did throughout the ages, would come upon different people at different times for certain purposes. And he did that here, but the glory credit goes to the Lord. To the Spirit coming upon him, and the Lord delivered. This is what he wanted the people to know. He wanted to teach them how to war against the adversary, against the physical enemies, against the powers of uh, darkness, and to be obedient. And so he brought them through as he always did. But doesn't God 
still have a plan lined up for the Israelites? Isn't he still going to see it's going to happen? As he did here, the Spirit, the Lord himself, work, and his plan and purpose for Israel includes his work, his working and carrying it out. Israel's not going to bring about their kingdom. They couldn't do it when Christ was here. They failed at that. They can't bring Christ back. They can't bring his kingdom to earth for the thousand years. Only God can do that. So as God was at work here, he is still at work, and he's going to continue to be at work when he, when he sends the Lord Jesus Christ back and delivers Israel into their kingdom finally. So this is how it works all the way through. Every page, cover to cover, it's that. Spirit of God, the work of the Lord, the power of the Lord, his word, and the warfare, the battle we continue to be in. Now, let's get on to Eglon. Now they had rest 40 years. Look at verse 12. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. There it is again. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. Now, we pointed out last week, I believe, that that refers mostly to Jericho, uh, an oasis area where you have all the plants and herbs and fruits and veggies and all the good stuff growing. So this uh, Eglon uh, smote Israel and took over the city of palm trees. He liked it there. He had plenty to eat. Uh, Deuteronomy 34 gives you another explanation, tells you that this is Jericho. So I won't make you turn back there. But look at verse 14. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Now we're getting into details on this one. And I read this and read this and read this. And as I mentioned last week, it, it's, it gets pretty gross. So I thought maybe let's just skip over this and go on to something else. But when something gives us this many details, uh, it's got to have some meaning to it. So... I read and read and read and thought and thought and thought and looked the references up, and finally I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to deal with it. Details. Look at verse 15. When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer. Doesn't he always do that? Always does that. They were down in Egypt, slaves, hundreds of years. They cried out to the Lord. Who'd he send? Moses. He sent Moses, yeah. Here he's bringing up this deliverer, a judge. That's what a judge was, a deliverer, a defender. Ehud, the son of Gera. Now, we're, uh, lots of details here. A Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And we uh, mentioned, I think, last week about the left-handedness, it's a detail, and it's there for a reason. And the, ben, the, the Benjamites were a lot of, of left-handed people. But Benjamin means in Hebrew, son of my right hand, I believe, it, if I'm not mistaken, the son of my right hand. But a lot of his descendants were left-handed. The thing here now to remember, and I did, didn't get that till this week, um, and I did point out also that around the world, being left-handed seems to be an unpopular thing. As a matter of fact, I can remember growing up, or even later, friends of ours having children, and, and a little, little tot was left-handed, and they were always switching stuff to their right hand, toys and things, to try to make them right-handed. Because for some reason, in ancient countries, it was a curse. It was a curse from God to be left-handed. And uh, I think that tied over to even current times to where people still feel, for some reason, it's not right to be left. <laughs> you know? Well, in, unless you're in politics, it ain't right to be left. So shall we continue with that one? No. <laughs> really don't want to offend anybody too much. Um, anyhow, it, it was a curse. And so here comes... And that 
you need to remember because I think it's important. Um, here comes Ehud, a Benjamite, left-handed, and the children of Israel were sending a present, maybe taxes, tribute, money, gifts, I don't know, to this Eglon. But Ehud made a dagger, which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And uh, if I can get it straight again, he put it on his right thigh because a dagger is a short sword, actually, 18 inches, pretty good, plus the handle. You reach across to pull it out like a sword. And so it would be on his right thigh. And I'm not sure he knew yet uh, that this was significant. And if you're right-handed, of course, you put it on your left hip. So when you would go in before the king, any kind of a search would automatically go to the left side because they didn't believe in being left-handed before the king. So uh, first of all, when they'd pat him down, they wouldn't feel that there was any sword, dagger, anything else there. So um, he went in. He, he, made the, uh, he made the dagger, two edges, very detail here, a dagger, two edges, a cubit length, put it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and more detail. Eglon was a very fat man. This is the only place in the Bible, I think, where you see that phrase or anybody described that way. So that means beyond b big, just huge guy, this king. And uh, more details. When he had, let's see, in verse 18, and when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people who bore the present. Now, this is Ehud, who had a contingency of guys with him to bring the present, whatever they were, and uh, he said, uh, you guys go ahead and, and let's leave. And he sent away those people. But he himself turned again, in verse 19, from the quarries. They go out of ways to the quarries. He turned back that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, keep silence. And all who stood by him went out from him. So Ehud goes back in before the king. He says, whispered in his ear said, uh, I have a secret for you, a secret errand unto thee. I got to tell you something good. And so uh, Ehud said, oh, boy, this sounds good. So he sent everybody out so they could have uh, secrecy and quiet and didn't want anybody else to hear what this great secret story was going to be. And uh, <clears throat> He said, uh, let's see, in verse 20, Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor. <coughs> now, this was his special place where he had his time alone and his uh, resting time and his, his wine and his food and shut the door and locked the door and be all to himself, whatever he wanted to do. It was his summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. See there? See, de get the details. Every verse is exploding with details here. He had himself alone, and Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. Oh, this has got to be important. Now, here's a heathen, <coughs> heathen king who undoubtedly had his Baal worship of some kind out there and uh, all kinds of false gods. But when he heard uh, Ehud say, my God is sending you a message. He stood up. He arose out of his seat. However long it may have taken him, he got up out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh. And it was probably at this point where he thought, oh, God made me a lefty. He made me a lefty, and now I know why. And he took out the dagger, and whoo, in it went. Does God make mistakes? Don't think so. I don't think. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12 for a second. I, I thought of this one yesterday, and I thought, wow, I'm glad this is in the Bible just for me. 
Doesn't have to be for anybody else, but it is. But I know it was a blessing to me. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, I think most of you know this passage, but it's good to look at these things once in a while. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 12. For as the body is one, now Paul's talking about the body of Christ here, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have made all to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, am I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? You know, some people don't mind being the foot. Uh, some people want to be the foot. Some people want to be the hand. Uh, we read on, and if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And, of course, the eye is very important, very important to the human being. And so is the ear, but you can lose either one or both. I mean, it's, uh, they're vital organs, but they're not the same. One is for vision and one is for hearing. And they can't argue, and the ear, is the ear going to say, well, I wish I was an eye? And is the eye going to say, I wish I was an ear? Start envying, the whole body starts to envy all the parts. God has us each in our ministry, each in our place. He doesn't make mistakes. In verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, what about the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where was the smelling? Oops. <laughs> now, how are we going to smell that great bacon cooking in the morning, you know? Or that whiff as you go by McDonald's, which automatically pulls your car into the drive through I mean, where would we be without the smelling? Or as Donna mentioned, going fr coming from Navarre, the, the skunk, somewhere the skunk smell, all the way up. And uh, it happens. There was one out in front of the church a few weeks back. That, that thing, was, you could smell it for a week. <coughs> and every time, well, what happens when you go by and there's a, a skunk out there in the road that's been killed or spraying a, a dog or something? It gets in the car. And you think the odor is five miles long, but it's just in the car. You know, you got your vents on, or your air conditioning, it's running. Wind, oh, that's bad. <coughs> so anyhow, that, it's all very interesting. Where were the smelling? Verse 18, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Now, was Ehud saying, uh, wish I was a righty? I wish I was a lefty again. I wish I had two right hands. Or did it suddenly strike him when he knew they had missed, when they frisked him, that he was lefty and he was able to get the knife out and slay the king? As it was happening, I kind of think he thought, ah, now I know why I'm a lefty. Now I know why I'm not the ear. I know I'm, I'm the hand and not the foot. I'm this, you're that. We're all in the body of Christ in our place. And if it were, verse 19, if they were all one member, where was the body? If everybody was an eye, where's the rest of the body? Where's the hands, the feet, and the ears, and the smelling, and all that? The nose. Some people are very nosy and love to be that way. But now, <laughs> in verse 21, and that I cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. You, you can see this. this is almost kindergarten. You could almost explain this to small children and they would get it. I think it's beautiful. Look at verse 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncommonly parts have more abundant comeliness. And this is all leading up to verse 25, which says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. 
Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. One member be honored, all the members rejoice. In verse 27, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And he goes on to explain apostles and prophets and preachers and so on. Go back to Judges. The point is that here's, here's a left-handed guy, Ehud, who uh, apparently went through his life being a second-class citizen because of the curse that God had put on him by making him a left-handed person. And uh, from what I can recall reading, about 90, 90 plus percent of the world's right-handed. And the stigma still carries. But how did God make you? God doesn't make mistakes. I know we do. But every one of us have a role and a place, a spot, and a ministry in the body of Christ that we, the whole body might function together, be no schism, that we suffer together and we re rejoice together. You can take one verse out of Judges and you can trace it all the way through as a practical point that it is a, has existed in every age, dispensation, in age, dispensation of grace, uh, and in the future. Because God has made us, and he makes no mistakes. He knows our every part. I am, didn't you say, gratefully or wonderfully made? Isn't that what was in your sermon today? How, what's, how's it go? Carefully. Oh, carefully and wonderfully? Oh, fearfully and carefully. And <laughs> you better be careful out there. I got the podium right now. Be careful. Oh. Well, anyhow, get back here to Ehud and maybe pressing a point a little bit too far, but God made him left-handed and is probably at that very moment he realized he was not under a curse that this is what gave him the victory, where other people felt that it was a curse. Anyhow, I think we've, we've given all the credit to the left-handed people we can. Yes? You think about the right-handed too, but you can't even shake hands with them. Yeah, right-handed, right hand, yes. You walk up and say, you know, I just really, really appreciate you putting his right hand on his shoulder, <coughs> nice and close, and let the guy at ease. And yeah. The left hand. Beautiful, yeah. Could it could have happened that way, huh? Yeah. Could have happened. He was never expecting it to come from the left hand. Uh, it reminds me, one time I was teaching a Sunday school class somewhere else, and um, it was it was from Paul's epistles about us being seated at the right hand of God. Our conversation, citizenship, is in heaven, not on the earth. And I made the comment that we're all we're all illegal aliens because we have some very uh, one-sided people there. Anyhow, um, pretty much uh, emphasizing through the class that we are seated with Christ now. If we are saved, we've accepted him at the right hand of God. And, of course, you always see him being referred to as or when he ascended, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And I thought... <coughs> Well, I hope the word gets through here, and, but you never know what's going to happen. And uh, after the class, somebody came to me and said, does God have something against left-handed people? And I'm thinking, is that all he got out of this? <laughs> and, uh, well, how, what a pity. I said, well, no, why do you ask that? He says, well, why is Jesus always seated at the right hand and not the left hand? What's... What's the problem with the left hand? And it uh, caught me off guard. But the point is, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not sure, right has always been the symbol of power. The right hand has been the symbol of power because 90% of the guys out there with weapons and swords and spears are with the right hand, so it became a symbol of power. Anyhow, uh, the point is that after 40 minutes or so of what I felt was a great Bible study lesson to bring people to Christ. All they got out of it was why is Christ on the right hand and not on the left? Because God's got something against left-handed people. And I think, oh, it's hopeless. Anyhow, 
Uh, they know what I'm talking about. Uh, anyhow, here, here it comes. Back in chapter 3, verse uh, 21, Ehud put forth his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And as I said, this thing is so loaded with details, it just keeps exploding. And uh, so I thought, well, details, is it the, they say the devil's in the details. Is that what the saying is? Anyhow, a lot of details here. So, and as you can see, so far, we detail after detail in these verses. So he thrust it, and in verse 22, the haft, or the hilt, that's the handle part, went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. It was stuck. 18 inches, so Ehud was probably way big, huge guy to do that. Pardon? Or oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I said Ehud. I meant Eglon. Uh, yes, the Star Wars character, yeah. You get a picture. Anyhow, uh, here we are. He couldn't, I mean, he just sucked in the whole dagger up to the handle. Disappeared. Couldn't get it out. But what's the next detail? And the dirt came out. Oh. The dirt came out. Why is that there? Do we, yeah, I know, but do we have to know that? <laughs> Apparently, it's there. And I'm sure it's referring to innards and uh, whatever was in there rotting away. Oh. But it's there. You've got to deal with it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable. Paul says this word of God is a comfort. And somewhere, there's got to be something that comes out of this besides the dirt. <laughs> so what do you get? Well, uh, here's what I got. Go with me to Hebrews 4. And some of you may already be ahead of me on this. Hebrews chapter 4. It's a familiar verse, so I guess we should really all know this without having to turn to it, but it's good to see it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick or alive and powerful and sharper than Ehud's dagger, than any two edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and cuts in and divides and guess what happens? The sword goes in, the dirt comes out. It's amazing. Look, at, at verse 13, you see him. The word him, almost the end of the verse. The antecedent, and I'm not an English major by any stretch, but I know how this works. The antecedent is the word of God in verse 12. And when the statement comes to a close, it ends with him, and it connects back to the word of God. He is the word, and the word is him, because the word of God is the antecedent in the structure of the verse. I'm just telling you that so I sound smart, but it's true. It's true. When the sword, how shall a young man cleanse his way? How do you clean the dirt? By taking heed thereto unto the word of God. The sword, the word of God, goes in and the dirt comes out. You clean up. You get yourself cleaned up when the word of God, the sword of the spirit, 
the two-edged sword and dividing the spirit and soul and marrow and bones asunder. The dirt comes out. He cleans us up. He is the word. And when we come to Christ and accept him as our Lord and Savior, because of his sacrifice and his shed blood and his death and his burial and his resurrection, his ascension and his coming again, because of all of that, we're clean. The sword goes in and the dirt comes out. Do we have another minute or two? Can we jump over to Psalm 119? This is amazing. I went through this psalm. It's pretty long, 176 verses, 119. There's some very familiar verses throughout this psalm. Psalm 119, there are 176 verses. I'm like Pete Kish. I'm, I counted yesterday. <laughs> I started counting all this, circling and notating. Uh, out of 176 verses, 181 times, God's word is mentioned. It's mentioned more times than there are verses here. Uh, and mentioned it in different ways. The law, that was God's word. Uh, ordinances, commandments, testimonies, precepts, and the actual word. 39 times in Psalm 119, you find the phrase, thy word, thy <coughs> word. And if you just do it just for practice, Go through this at home and circle law, precepts, testimonies, thy word, um, ordinances, commandments. Those are all referring to what God has said. So look first of all in verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse? How do you get rid of the dirt? By taking heed thereto unto thy sword, thy word. Verse 10, with my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I, what? Hidden. Hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against it. It's the word. It's the sword goes in. And cleansing takes place. The dirt comes out. Uh, look at verse, uh, verse 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 70, deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. And this goes all the way through. Verse 25, my soul clingeth to the dust. Revive me according to thy word. When I'm in distress, the sword, the sword. Distresses the dirt, the sword comes and takes it away. Uh, verse uh, 28, my soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen me, thou, me, according to thy word. Strength. I'm losing my strength. The world is getting to me. I can't stand this political mess anymore. But boy, we can stand this. Stand his word. Cleans us up. Gets us strength. Uh, look at verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. Um, well, this, you can go on and on. Look at verse 57. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. Verse 65, thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. You're either under affliction, you're strayed. Now, back into the word. I kept thy word. So, well, uh, our time is up, and I appreciate that, and we'll continue with, uh, there's a little more on Eglon, <clears throat> and uh, then we move on from that. So next week we'll continue with that, and uh, 
Anybody have any questions or thoughts on what we've already talked about? If you see the principles on, in the details, when the details start to accumulate like they did in this chapter, in these few verses, pay attention. Start to see, what is this? What's it saying? What's it going to do for me? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we've had this time together for your word, for the salvation you have worked out on our behalf, and have given to us freely through your grace. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we got a visitor today. <laughs> Another Mr. Burwell. <laughs>